Good evening and welcome. It's good to see each of you here tonight. Uh, we want to take this opportunity to, to welcome you here and, and especially those that are visiting with us. We appreciate your being with us. We invite you to come back to see us anytime that you can. We do meet um, Wednesdays as our next service at 7 o'clock. We meet Sunday morning at 9 with Bible classes following that. Um, you can tell from our number tonight the youth are, are missing. They are at the Hay activity at SMART. And uh, just as a reminder, the, the church van should be back by 7.30 to 7.45. Uh, they've also, for the, uh, they've got the Erupt Youth Rally coming up the 22nd through the 24th. The Lock-In 2021 is scheduled for November the 5th. And there's a sign-up sheet. They need volunteers. If you can help with that, please sign up the list on the bulletin board. And our annual fall festival is November the 6th. Uh, please sign on the bulletin board if you can bring soups and desserts for that. There's a baby shower coming up next Sunday, the 24th, from 1 to 3 at Clint and Lynette Kesey's house for Courtney Maynard. Uh, please see the bulletin for the details where they're registered for gifts. They're also registered at Walmart and Target. Um, also, there is a wedding gift card shower for Justice and Brian Knowles. And Justice is the daughter of Matthew and Chancey Woodside. This is in lieu of a traditional wedding shower. There's a gift bag on the pew in the foyer. And just drop off to that. And they would like to have this done completed by Wednesday, the 20th. Uh, I was told this morning that the best and the most desired visitation team meets tonight. But I told Joe that wasn't right. <laughs> the visitation team three does meet tonight following services. Um, we had a, uh, there's also, we received a thank you card from the family of Willis Roberts and that is on the bulletin board. We want to remember those that we're aware of that, that, we, that are sick. We have these listed at home, Steve Nearing, Thomas Owens, Sandra Olivas, Noel Pepper, Jean Ware, Billy Welch. I am happy to today and the sun shines bright, the clouds have been rolled away. For the Savior's never so ever will may come with him who stay. Whosoever should be at peace, should Oh, sure, be happy. Who 
24, and after this song, we'll have prayer. Almighty God and Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this Lord's Day. We're so thankful for the opportunity to always be here to study from your word. We're so thankful, Father, that you are our God, that you show the love for us and creating us and giving your son, Jesus, to die upon the cross for us. Or there's so many other ways that we can acknowledge you, Father, and what, all the things you've done for us, by the things you provide both materially and spiritually. We're so thankful for the church, especially here at Bobby Branch. We pray for the church throughout all the world. We pray for each and every effort to reach the lost souls, Father. We ask and pray, Father, that you help us to be mindful of this work. Help us to be mindful that when we're at work, we may be around someone who has never heard of you, who's never thought about you, or maybe someone who has, Father, that needs more information. Help us, to Father, to show them you by the way we, we act, by the things we say. Help us, Father, to always be a great example to everyone we come in contact with. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the lesson that was taught this morning. We pray, Father, you help us to be mindful of your word every day. Help us to study your word. Help us, Father, to hunger and thirst after righteousness and the things that you would have us to do in this life, Father. Help us to take your word and transform our very lives, Father, so that all that are come in contact and see us, Father, will know what it means to be a Christian. Help us, Father, to set the, the right examples and the, the things we say and do, Father, and when we're out in the world, we pray, Father, that we never tarnish your name or, or the church. We thank you, Father, for Bobby Branch. We thank you for the work it does. We thank you for the, the Bible classes here, and we pray for our youth. We pray for their parents. We ask you, Father, to be with uh, Jason and his work, and we're so thankful that Bobby Branch will provide this congregation with the youth, youth minister, and we're so thankful for all the work and the time and the love and the energy and your word that goes into our youth, and we pray for them, Father, that as they grow up, they'll stay faithful, that they'll raise Christian families. We thank you, Father, for our adult Bible classes as well. We pray and help Hope, Father, that we can all be mindful for the things that are taught, that we'll always be attentive. We pray for the singing here, that we'll all be a part of it, that we'll be mindful, Father, that it is part of worship, that we'll take it serious, and that we'll, that we'll be engaged in that part of the worship. We're thankful for the, the time that we put into the Lord's Supper, and for those who get up here and enact that part of the worship, Father, and the, the things they read from Scripture, the things that they have to say, and the comments they make, Father, to help prepare our minds. We pray for the preaching tonight, Father. We pray that you'll be with the one that's speaking. And we're so thankful for them, Father, as they fill in for Tony. And we're so thankful for Tony and the time that he puts into your word, Father, to, to help teach us. And maybe some things that we're, that we're not um, as good a, as at um, understanding, Father. We're so, so thankful, Father, that he can make it easy for us to be able to attain that information. We ask you now, Father, to be with us through the rema remainder of the service. We pray, Father, everything's done in spirit and truth. And we pray, Father, that you would 
Help us always to seek first your kingdom. Uh, help us to be mindful of those, Father, who do without clothing and food. And we thank you for the efforts here to help provide those things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're using the book, please uh, mark numbers 255 for the invitation song, 255. Now let us sing number 430, 430. My name is in the book of life, oh bless the name of Jesus. I rise above all doubt and strife, and make my title clear. I know, I know, I know, my name is from Matthew chapter 23 verses 11 and 12 but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant and whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted certainly good to see each of you tonight good to have you here good to have those of you who are watching online or with us as well of course, Tony is finishing up his gospel meeting at Dibral. We miss him. We always miss him when he is not here with us because he is such of a part of this congregation. But well, I thought Jason gave his best sermon this morning. He did a wonderful job. If you didn't catch that, I encourage you to uh, go back and watch that. It was an outstanding job. Be turning in your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Now, we know many times there are people who never read the Bible, who never open it, who do not know anything about it, but they will try to use the Bible to justify their lives, and their actions. One of the most common ways this is seen, but if you condemn someone of their life or their sin, then they would come back and say, well, uh, Jesus said that you're not supposed to judge. Jesus would not judge me. Jesus was all about love. Jesus would never say anything to me. Well, if you ever run across that, kindly refer them to Matthew chapter 23. For in this one chapter, we find Jesus delivering some of his most harshest denunciation on sin 
and on hypocrisy. Some of his strongest plain talk and the calling of names on the part of the scribes and the Pharisees. As we're about to study what Jesus told the multitudes at this time, this takes place during the last week of Christ's life. In just a few short days, we're going to have his crucifixion and his death upon the cross. Now, we know throughout his earthly ministry, those Jewish leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they had tried to question him, tried to trick him, tried to deceive him, tried to outwit him, tried to catch him in some words. But Christ's wisdom was always too great for them. So as his days grow short upon this earth, Christ gathers the multitude, his apostles and disciples, his followers, and he warns them of the scribes and the Pharisees and their influence upon their lives. Looking at Matthew 23, verse 1, Then Jesus spake unto the multitude and to his disciples, verse 2, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That is, the scribes and the Pharisees were responsible for teaching Moses' word, God's law unto the people. They had that responsibility, that obligation to faithfully discharge their duties in interpreting God's law for the people to understand. And they also had the responsibility with it to prepare the hearts and the minds of the people for the coming Messiah. But at both counts, they failed miserably. As men who had the authority and the responsibility that went with teaching God's law, they failed the people that they were supposed to teach and to instruct. Verse 3. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say, and they do not. Jesus tells his followers that the, the, whatever the scribes and the Pharisees would bid you to do religiously, you do. You observe what Moses would have you to do. You follow after their words but do not follow after their works, their lives, their actions. See, the, the authority of God's word does not come from the teacher. The authority comes from God himself. Now, it's much easier if the one teaching lives a righteous life. That's a strong encouragement for obedience unto God's word. And conversely, it's also true that when the one teaching is inconsistent, is sinful, or outright evil, then that's going to hinder the acceptance and the obedience of God's word. Verse 4. For they, the scribes and the Pharisees, they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. The scribes and the Pharisees always took the strictest, most legalistic interpretation of the Mosaic law, of the Jews' responsibility and religious duty. And they applied this law to make it as harsh as possible for other people, but not for themselves. See, they did not follow their own strict teaching. They would always find an out. They would always find that loophole in the law that excluded them. They would bind not only God's law, upon the people in its most strict terms. But they would as well bind the traditions of man upon the people. 
You know, many times in Jesus' earthly ministry, the scribes and the Pharisees accused Jesus of violating the law. This is wrong. He did not violate the law. He kept the law of Moses perfectly. What he violated was the tradition of some of the Jews. Now, Jesus said this, this binding of the law in its harshest terms, as well as the tradition, was a heavy burden. It was hard to bear. It was hard to carry for the Jewish people. It was hard to live this difficult spiritual life following after God's commands and man's traditions. Then the, the scribes and the Pharisees would do nothing to, to help or to, to encourage and support the people. When the people would have problems in encouraging, in supporting or, or following and keeping the law as the scribes gave it to them, they would not even lift a finger to help their fellow Jews. See, they had no mercy. They had no compassion. They had no sympathy for the people that they taught, for the people that they were supposed to watch over and care for religiously. Such was the state of the religious world for the Jews as when Christ walked this earth. And you can see the need for Christ talking to his disciples in this way and manner. Verse 5. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. See, the scribes and the Pharisees were, were not interested in, in the uh, people obeying God. Uh, they were not anxious even themselves to please God. Uh, they wanted to be seen. They wanted to be noticed. They wanted to be seen to be religious more than they wanted to be religious themselves. See, they wanted the praise of the people. They wanted the, the people to point them out, how, how good, how righteous, how devout they looked. They wanted to be noticed. They wanted to be seen. We know when Christ was delivering his Sermon on the Mount, he told the people that, that, that they need to beware of, of, of having their long prayers and, and their fasting and their giving if all they're doing it for was to be seen of men. There's nothing wrong with prayers and fasting and giving if it's done for the right reason. But if it's to be done to be seen, to be religious. Christ said then, well, you, you've had your reward. It goes no further than that, than the praise and the adulation that you would get from mankind. Now, Jesus in this talk tells the people two ways in which the scribes and the Pharisees had taken the Mosaical law to a higher point and used it to call attention to themselves. One way was with their phylacteries. Now, a, a phylactery was a, a small box, and in that box, it would contain a, a scripture. And what the Jews would do they would take this box and they'd put it on their forehead right between their eyes and they'd tie it with a leather strap or they'd wear it on their left arm or both places. And they did it to be seen, to be devout, to, to be religious. And, and to, to justify this, they went back to the book of Deuteronomy as Moses gave God's law to the people in Deuteronomy 6 and 8. Now let me just read you what the Mosaical law said, what Moses said to the people in Deuteronomy 6 chapter, verses 6 through 8. Moses talking to the people, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. Notice where the words should be, in your heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk to them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down and when thou risest up, stressing the importance of ever keeping God's law before them. 
And that's good message for us today. That's something we need to heed as well. To always keep God's law and will before us. From the rising in the morning to the going to bed at night. Ever be knowledgeable. Recognizing. Having God's law before us. And in verse 8. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand. And thou shalt be as frontlets between thine eyes. Not taken literally, but taken figuratively. Carry God's word in your heart and in your mind. The scribes and the Pharisees went for a literal interpretation of this scripture. Now we know in the Old Testament the Jewish leaders never went away like this. They never wore these phylacteries. It was only started during that interbible period, that period between when the Old Testament ended and the New Testament began. They began this practice. And of course, the bigger the phylactery, the more they would be noticed, the more they would be seen. The, the other way that Jesus said that they called attention to themselves was through the borders of their garments. Now, the Jews from of old, at, at the hem of their garment, at the hem of their robes, they would have a blue thread, which was to be woven into the hems of their garments. And, and this was handed down to them that God specifically said it would be this color, it would be blue. You'd put this at the hem of your garments. And blue is still that color that's associated with the Jewish nation today. You remember what the color of the flag of the Jewish nation is? Blue and white. But what the scribes and the Pharisees would do, they broadened that thread to a stripe. Then that stripe wasn't big enough because other people had that little stripe. They had bigger stripes. And then if that wasn't enough, they began to hang tassels at the end of their garments as well. All to be seen, all to be noticed, all to call attention to themselves and how religious they were. So Christ says in verse 6, continuing his condemnation on their lives, and love the uppermost rooms at the feast and the chief seats in the synagogues. See, they were more interested in to be seen of men to appear to be righteous than in actually being righteous themselves. And, and this hypocrisy carried into their wanting the, the best for themselves. The, the chief seats. The chief seats in the synagogues were those in front. Now, it, in the first century, the, the teaching was reversed the way we have it today. Today, the, the speaker stands in front and everybody else sits down. In the first century, everybody stood up. And the speaker, the teacher, sat down. Well, there were others down front with him. And there were seats here. And the chief seats were the ones right in front with the speaker. Because as everybody would look at the speaker, they would also be sitting, staring at the ones sitting behind. Those were the chief seats where they could be seen, where they could be noticed. The chief seats also applied to the the feast and the festivals which they had to, to honor some guest. The chief seats would be those right next to the guest of honor. Or if it was some host that provided a festival and gave it some feast, uh, then sitting close to the host. The closer you got to the one of honor or to the host, the more high up you were. And the pecking order was the further away you got, the less you counted. They loved those chief seats. Christ continues, verse 7. And, and greetings in the markets. And to be called to men, rabbi. Rabbi. Their, 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 their dress and their, their attire didn't end with, with, with just the Jews. Uh, th this ornamentation 
that they wore to be seen or to be noticed was carried forth into other religions. To, even today, we have some who would wear robes, gowns, shawls, special collars, uh, uh, all to denote that they're set apart, all to be noticed, all to stand out, all to be different. Now, these scribes and, and, and Pharisees not only wore these garments that, that called attention to themselves, that made them stand out, but, but they wanted to be recognized not only as being religious, but they wanted to be not just seen, but they wanted to be called religious in that they loved to be called a rabbi. Now, in its, in its lowest form, this, this just means teacher. And a rabbi was a Jewish doctor of the law. He had studied and excelled in his knowledge of God's law. Now, in a perfect world, with that knowledge of God's law would come the responsibility and the duty of teaching it to their fellow Jews who wasn't as educated and as knowledgeable as you. But they failed at that miserably. When they had this Jewish doctor of the law, when they had that, that knowledge, they wanted to be recognized as that. They wanted to be called rabbi, not in his lowest sense as teacher, but in his highest sense, meaning master. And the highest form of all would be Rabboni. That is only used in the scripture on one person. It means master teacher. That was Jesus Christ himself. I like what Kaufman said in his commentary on these scriptures here. Uh, we're talking about the scribes and the Pharisees. He said they were little men, puffed up with their supposed learning, parading like peacocks before the admiring eyes of their followers, inwardly gloating over titles of honor and deference. They were empty of good. They were blinded by their own pride. Can you see why Jesus would want to warn his disciples in his last days? of the influence of these scribes and Pharisees. Yes, do what they say, but don't do what they do. Verses 8, 9, and 10, Christ talks plainly about titles. But be ye not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your Father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your Master, even Christ. What Jesus says in these words is, is plain, it's, it's easy to understand that his followers should not use titles because titles so often lead those that don't have them to yield a submission to another person, leading submission to their opinion, to their judgment, to rely upon them, to defer to them as one who has authority. When titles are used, when they're allowed in a religious sense, there's always that sinful implication that comes with it of authority. Mankind has a tendency to defer to a title, to give with that title, whether it be reverend or doctor or father or master or rabbi, whatever. That title will carry with it authority. It will raise, it will elevate the one having that title above the rest. And along with that elevation, along with that authority, will come the legislate, the absorbing, the binding, the losing, the requiring, the, the demanding in any religious sense, whatever that one wants to put upon another. 
So that's the great harm of titles. Jesus is very plain. Not to be found within a religious body. And when it comes to religious titles, we should not seek them. We should not desire them for ourselves. And just as we're not interested in wearing phylacteries or, or, or long tassels on our coats, we shouldn't be interested in elevating with a title. In terms of rank, you know we're all the same. What we are are brothers and sisters. We all stand equal before the foot of the cross. Christ says this well as we end our lesson with verses 11 and 12. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exhausted. See, Christ has been talking about the Pharisees and the scribes, how they love to elevate themselves, how they love to be above everyone else, how they loved the chief, how they wanted to be the best, how they wanted to be sought out, how they wanted to be known, how they wanted to be greatest and the most recognized. Now, their pride demanded that. It would accept nothing less. Now, contrast that attitude with what Jesus just said in verses 11 and 12. Jesus said the greatest would be the servant. Jesus honors and blesses true humility and loving service. So we each have to ask ourselves, as we come together, uh, are we here today to be served? Or do we come together to serve? As we look at our brothers and sisters sitting here, every time we come and gather, do, do we see others as them benefiting us in some way? Or do we look at one another and, and we look and we see each other and we're thinking, what can I do to make your life easier? What can I do to help you? What can I do to support you. What can I do to encourage you? Because we know we have that personal responsibility for our own salvation for, with fear and trembling. But we're also carried with us the responsibility for our fellow brothers and sisters. Not only are we supposed to be concerned with getting ourselves to heaven, but we need to be concerned with helping one another get there as well. So as we look at one another, we need to look at each other through a servant's eyes. That's what Jesus wants us to do. We need humility and service within the Lord's body. We've already had too much pride within the church through its history. And that pride has always brought with it problems. Proud, arrogant people, striving, pushing, contending against one another, desperate to have their way, trying to seek some advantage, trying to be recognized, noticed, and called the shot. When that happens, that divides a congregation quickly. The danger in that needs to be offset with the responsibility that we need to recognize in each one of us to be servants, to care for one another, to look out for one another. But see, the, the world we live in, Servants are, are looked down upon. You know, ask a little child, what do you want to be when you grow up? 
I've never heard one yet say, ooh, ooh, I want to be a servant. No. Where did they learn that at? From life, from the TV, from what they see and what they hear. Most of us would rather be served than to serve. Jesus tells us that in God's family, being a servant makes us like Christ. Remember he said in Mark 10, verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Lord is looking for people who want to serve him, who want to serve the church, who want to serve their brothers and sisters, who want to serve the world by taking the gospel to them. Are we doing that? Does that describe your life? If so, well done. Keep it up. It's good work. It's a wonderful life. You give to God, to your brothers and sisters, and to your fellow man. If you're not a servant of Christ, now is a wonderful time to become one. If you never obeyed the gospel, or if you've fallen away from your service to God, won't you consider this opportunity? And if you need to come, won't you come as we stand and sing? had the opportunity today to, to, today to partake of the Lord's Supper and to give if you've been prospered, if you'll make your way to the door on this side of the auditorium that has been left prepared and there are brethren there that will assist you with that part of your worship service. Once again, we say thank you so much for being here. If you're visiting with us, thank you so much for being here. We'll hope you want to come back and be with us at another opportunity. <clears throat> 
I have to agree with what Brother Ray told us about Jason. Jason delivered a fine lesson this morning, but I also want to say, Brother Ray, you delivered a fine lesson this evening. We appreciate you. This congregation is so blessed to have men who can fill in when Tony is gone, and we are certainly blessed to have people like uh, Brother Ray and Jason to fill in. Let's remember our midweek Bible study that will be Wednesday at 7 p.m. Let's all make our plans now to be back then. And now Brother Leonard's going to lead us in this final hymn. <clears throat> As we come to thee tonight at the close of this service, we do so thanking thee for the opportunity that we've had today to be here, hear two fine lessons proclaimed to us. Father, we ask thee to be with us as we separate from this place, bring us back to our next service, and forgive us, Father, of any sins that might be in our lives. Through all this, we ask through your Son and our Savior's name. Amen. Amen.